All right. Finch, picking up where we left off a few weeks ago, reading through the book and talking to some other F-14 crewmen, it pondered a question. Um, in your time in the Navy, did you ever meet any of the MiG killers from the Vietnam era or the post-Vietnam era? Yes. Uh, the uh, the biggest one was probably Denny Wisely. He was a skipper of Kennedy uh, during my cruise. He was a MiG killer in uh, Vietnam and, of course, in the F-4. And uh, so uh, he was my uh, ship's captain on the uh, Kennedy. And uh, there was another, uh, not in my Navy time, but in my dad's squadron, when 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 my dad had VF-43, which was the East Coast top gun squadron, basically, uh, he had it in the 73-74 uh, time frame. And that was when the... Uh, when the POWs came back. So there was two things. He had a couple of guys who had come through and been assigned to his squadron who were MiG killers. Mike Edel was one of them. He was, it was, that was an interesting story. Uh, Mike Edel was a, uh, was a Navy guy, the pilot of the F-4. And he was of course an a, a A-4 pilot or an F-4 pilot, but he was on an exchange duty with the Air Force. So he was in the back seat of this F-4. The pilot of this F-4, of this Air Force F-4, was a Marine pilot from the Marine Corps. So it was a Marine Corps pilot, a Navy Rio in an Air Force jet, and they went out and bagged a MiG. So that was an interesting story. Mike Edel, unfortunately, uh, a, a couple of years later, after my dad left the squadron and we'd moved to England, he was... Uh, they were uh, doing a lot of training to uh, to requalify with air-to-air uh, -air refueling. And uh, at that time, during the 1973 war, we sent a bunch of A-4s to Israel with Operation uh, Nickel Grass, they called it. And, uh, and so since that was a transplant, the A-4s might have had to have... Uh, plugged in an awful lot, and the pilots who translanted these aircraft uh, hadn't had hadn't been plugging in for air-to-air uh, -air refueling for a bit. And uh, so Mike Edel, who was the basically the XO of the squadron at, the, at that time, was plugging in and the and the uh, and the basket broke, a bunch of gas went down the intake, snuffed out the A4's engine, the the, uh, the Skyhawks engine. And so he was trying to relight the engine, couldn't get it relit. And so he tried to eject, the seat would not fire. So he had to ride it in and died. So that was uh, that was Mike Edel. You might want to look him up and re read about his story. Wow, I mean, and it's interesting within the aviation community. I mean, and this goes back to World War One, and of course to the present time, how many, you know, MIG killers or even ACEs that go on to test pilot programs or just in training accidents where it's just a fluke and it's just the nature of the game in the community. Uh, unfortunate accident like that and the experience that's lost. It is. When you think to think about Hank Clayman, he was uh, in the VF-41 uh, lead aircraft. He uh, he bagged that uh, Libyan MIG and then a, a number, of years, number of years later was flying an F-18 that uh, hydroplaned and flipped over and uh, that's how he died. And it's interesting that perhaps a lot of folks outside of the aviation community don't realize that, that they think that, you know, the MiG killers or that the ACEs, they're untouchable, that, you know, they've been through this, they've shown that they're excellent fighter pilots and they'd be lucky. But realistically, in the aviation community, you never know. No, you you don't. It, it, it's everybody that goes through the same risks takes the same chances, flies the same type airplanes and all that stuff. Doesn't matter if you're a MiG killer. Even thinking about Yuri Gagarin, who was the first man in space. He died in a uh, in a military jet crash a number of years afterwards. So it, it doesn't matter what you do, you're you're still taking those risks. Absolutely. And you know, and with that risk, it's something that's accepted with the job in itself. And My dog is being a bit of a nuisance real quick, but she's sweet as can be. But in, it brings up the point, I mean, in your career in the Navy, because um, I know 
talking with uh, Magic, talking with uh, Hey Joe, they've mentioned that, you know, roughly they lost a friend a year in the Navy in some kind of accident. So if I may ask in your service, how many friends or people did you know were lost in accidents from your time? Not, the- not that many, really. I, I had uh, I had three basic uh, sets of orders during my active duty time frame with well, and counting the training command, I guess that'd be four. And uh, after we uh, went to our individual squadrons, there were a couple I knew that 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 we lost. But during my VF fourteen years, we didn't lose any, anybody. After that, I was uh, spent two years up at Grumman, so that was a very very tight community. Only about ten or twelve people there, but between the F fourteen, the A six, and the uh, E2 prop community, didn't lose anybody there. And my last tour was catapult officer on, on Eisenhower and we didn't lose anybody there. So uh, if I had stayed flying, then obviously, obviously there would have been more people who, who have been lost, but uh, we, uh, we didn't lose anybody during my, my flying time. So I was, I was pretty lucky with that. Yes, sir. Well, mentioning your time, of course, um, in active squadron here uh what i was curious what sponsored or what was the idea to publish the book what led you to that well i've I've been thinking about that and i knew the book would come up the uh i i kind of took after my dad my dad you know he was a he was a westpac guy all of his cruises all of his carrier time was spent on the west coast well i take that back in the, in the 50s, he was on Intrepid, which was based out of Quonset Point, Rhode Island. So he did a uh, North North Atlantic cruise there. But uh, by and large, all of his combat stuff was Westpac and whatnot. So he spent a lot of time in Japan and China. So he got into cameras. He had always been a photographer, but uh, buying cameras was a big thing. So he did that. I got a ton of his squadron from VA-56 back in the mid-60s. Uh, of uh, photos that he took, airborne photos, which are very cool and I'm working on cleaning up and posting in uh, various A4 groups. But uh, I bought my first camera when I uh, first got to the training command. It was a it was a good Minolta X370. And so I started that whole aviation taking pictures. Back then it was a little bit more difficult because it was all film. So you had to set the aperture, set the film speed, do this, do that, and the other. Everybody could be a photographer now with the digital uh, cameras and whatnot, but uh, I did that. So I started taking photos, and I ended up, especially with that, uh, with all those photos you saw in that in that VF-14 book, 99 Camelots, that uh, they were bummed. <laughs> They'd been sitting around in, in my office for the next 25, 30 years, and then I'd, I had the uh, advent of uh, self-publishing books really came to a fore. I mean, I I wasn't I've I've gotten to be Facebook friends with Heater Heatley, and we talked a little bit about that. He was a trained photojournalist when he was flying. I wasn't anything like that, so I never thought that any any that any of my photos were going to do anything. And then finally, about 2015 or 2016. I came across this uh, this self publishing book company called Blurb, and I thought, hey, I'm 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 going to go through these things, pick out the best fifty or sixty pictures, and just throw this thing together and see what I got. So I did that, and I had absolutely no plans to uh, do a book when I was taking these pictures. I was taking them because they looked pretty cool and they were kind of neat, and uh, but it did turn out, and I think the book was kind of neat. Well, speaking of the books, I mean, the title, 99 Camelot. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, is that a call sign or what's that reference to? Well, it's a reference to a uh, to a radio call. It's not for a specific kind of or type of uh, to a specific aircraft or something like that. But it's a broadband broadcast radio call that means, in our case, 99 Camelots. Our squadron call sign was Camelot. We would be Camelot 107, Camelot 100, Camelot 103, whatever Camelot, and then the side number of the airplane was. If you did a 99 Camelot call, 
It was a call intended for every Camelot aircraft that was flying at that time, like 99 Camelots. Be advised, it's, it's foggy back on base. You might have a delay in landing. So you, you're not talking to one specific airplane. You're talking to all of them and giving them a broad base, a broadband kind of uh, kind of announcement that needs to be made. Well, I mean, through that, the book is brilliant, and I'm thank you for explaining that, and I think that does an excellent segue that, you know, this is for the Camelots when you were there from 87 to, if I'm not mistaken, 90. Is that correct? That's correct. At 87 through 90, I uh, didn't really have anything else. There was, after I finished up with VF-14, I was with Grumman for, for a couple of years, so I got, I got some photos. The thing with Grumman is that you're flying, when you're doing a flight acceptance flight, that is not a Navy airplane. That's a Grumman airplane. So you never... It's not certified to fly in formation with anybody else for the most part. For the for, So uh, you really didn't have the opportunity to take pictures of other airplanes when you're flying there at Grumman. So uh, all the photos I took really were, uh, were during that 90 or uh, 87 to 90 time frame. And uh, it kind of, it was meant for anybody, but I've been trying to track down all of my old squatter mates and, just send them a book. I don't charge them for it. I don't ask for any money or anything like that. I just want to say this is a pretty big part of our life. And uh, hopefully this will bring back some memories. Wow. Now, speaking of that, the reaching out with the old squadron mates, has that been received pretty well? Are a lot of guys like, oh, wow, like um, you have this photograph of me in the pilot seat or the Rio seat doing this, anything like that? Well, yes and no. It, it, a lot of the photos you can tell. I do know who's in them in some of them. Other ones, you can't tell. They got their helmets on, their visors down, their mask on. You don't know who's flying. You don't know who's uh, back in the real seat. So, uh, but we had the, uh, you know, the uh, squadron was, was, spent, was started in 1919. So in 2019, we had the big 100th 100, year birthday for VF-14. Down in Pensacola. A uh, bunch of people came. So we had a, a gathering of probably about 15 of our squadron mates from that time frame. Wow. And I took a parcel of books down there. And uh, my mom's calling. Let me get this real quick. Go for it. I can pause this in itself. Well, no, no, no. Don't pause it. Hi, Mama. I'm on my interview right now. Okay. I'm just telling you that I'm back home again. Okay, good. Thank you. I'll. Yep, yeah, we'll do the interview and I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> love you bye-bye all right we well, got that but uh i i took about a, a dozen and a half books down there and i i would sign of course each one or call sign it was great flying with you or uh whatever it was that i did uh tom cats forever vf 14 top hatters forever pinch so uh it was really good and i did get some really good feedback from some of the guys on that they really enjoyed it well, and I figured that they definitely would. I mean, the book is brilliant. Um, I've read at it. The photos are great. I've got two favorite photographs personally. Um, I guess number I one, know which one visually, um, I'll actually pull it up right here. Um, I don't know how this is going to work with the uh, reverse camera, but um, I, one of them is going to be, I think, a little shocking for perhaps you, maybe some of the viewers. Where did it go? I just saw it. This is my number one favorite photograph. I love the Tomcat shot, full afterburner, uh, right there with the sun. I mean, it's just gorgeous. That is a beautiful shot there. Yep, yep. That, that was kind of interesting. I, I thought about that one a lot. I can't remember exactly when I took that. It was a little bit, uh, probably during cruise. But uh, when I first got to the ship, Rick Neidlinger, who actually, he was a pilot, went on to be a CO of the Enterprise. He was a safety officer of the squadron, and he told all of us newbies, you don't need to be walking around the flight deck when you're not getting ready to go and man up a jet when there's during, during flight ops. He was taking care of us and making sure we weren't doing anything like that. Needles was his call sign. So uh, I, I don't really remember exactly when I took that, if it was later on in the squadron, but that's what the timing was. We were... Uh, uh, probably on workups or uh, something like that, maybe down in the uh, down in the Puerto Rican op area. I can't remember if it was a pinky shot. 
at night or if it was a morning shot. I might have written it. I don't remember the caption that I put on that thing right then. But, uh, yeah, that was kind of cool with that one. Well, and, I mean, I've got a poster in my classroom um, that's got – I've got a lot of different posters, but one of them – I don't know which squadron it is. I think I'd have to do some more research on it, but it's a beautiful orange pink um, sunrise. And you've got a F-14 that's just been launched off the bow of the ship, full afterburner, wings are out. You know the look, and it's getting ready to peel off to the right. It's a beautiful shot. Um, so I've always loved those early morning shots of F-14s, F-4s, um, A-4s, just getting launched off a carrier. I think it's beautiful. Now, my second favorite photograph is one that, like I said, might be a little shocking, but it's the weather conditions that oftentimes oh, yeah. face yeah. at sea. Yep. Yep, that now, was taken off the uh, off the Virginia coast. It was, uh, we were getting close to the Gulf Stream, so you got that combination of warm water and cold air coming up, and that's what caused all those, uh, all that sea fog coming up. You see the, uh, and that was early in, in, my, uh, in my VF-14 time. Because on the tail of the jet of the F-14, you can see all we had at that time was the uh, round top hat squadron symbol. Yes, sir. We didn't have the uh, triangular dart, which came a little bit later in my uh, in, in my top hatter career. So we had that, the uh, VF-72, uh, I think it was, or uh, VA-72, the A the A6 that was parked right next to us, they're on Cat 4 and we're on Cat 3. So uh, we had uh, set the alert and everything was good. And uh, that was probably an early morning picture. Well, and I was about to ask, you know, some people would see these conditions and they want to know, is this a launchable condition? Can you launch off the carrier and recover onto the carrier? Oh, yes. Yes, quite. Without a doubt. We've launched in and recovered in a whole lot. I mean, that's nothing. That's just fog coming up. So there's no wind. There, there's no rain. There's no, uh, there's no thunderstorms. There's no uh, clouds aside from just the fog coming up. And you can see it's in, it's in, it's in sea fog. So it's, uh, it doesn't block anything. Yes, that, that's just got to get the wind over deck requirements. And once you have that, you're good to go. Now, and. Uh... Rolling with that, and this photograph is a perfect example, perhaps a lot of people think that on um, on the John F. Kennedy that it's only the F-14, only VF-14s on that boat. That's not the case. You share the ship with a lot of different other squadrons. So what kind of aircraft and squadrons would be on aircraft carriers? Well, at that time, and this was uh, one thing that I'm really proud of, that was the absolute peak of the F-14s fighter career. They're in the late 80s going into the early 90s. So every air wing had two F-14 squadrons. In our case, it was VF-14 and VF-32. And each uh, each squadron would, would have 10 to 12 jets, something around that. So there'd be about 20, maybe uh, maybe 24 F-14s there. <clears throat> we usually had two A-6 attack squadrons. In our case, we had uh, one Marine squadron and one Navy squadron. And each one of those would have eight to 10 jets. So that's another 16 to 20 jets. So that's F-14s and A-6s. A that's the power projection side of things. We're going to go drop bombs. We're going to go down and shoot other airplanes. And as it says on the back of the book, as Von Richthofen said, all we do is we uh, fly around and we shoot other people. Anything else is rubbish. So we got that. We had anti-submarine aircraft with the S-3 Air, aircraft that was on the uh, in the air wing. They had a dozen planes or so. We had the early warning aircraft with the E-2. So they had about four or five aircraft there. So you've got fighter, you know, missile shooters like us, like the F-14, attack bomb drummers like the A-6, anti-submarine aircraft like the S-3, anti- uh, or the uh, radar aircraft like the E-2, and, uh, and of course, helicopters. Later on, we would have uh, single-seat attack aircraft like the A-7 or the F-18. So, yeah, there's about uh, six or seven different types of aircraft that, are, that, that make up the air wing. Now, 
at sea, is there any competition between the squadrons, any kind of rivalry, perhaps stealing um, any kind of insignia, playing pranks on one another, or is it all pretty business? Oh, no, it's all, of course there is. It's <laughs> terrible. Our our sister squadron, the, uh, well, I can't say what we, what we really called them, but uh, their big uh, squadron symbol was this big broad axe sword kind of thing. They were called the swordsmen. And of course, they were the blades and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, there was always stuff going on between. There was always there was there was professional competition, and then there was uh, just trying to get the uh, get their goat kind of stuff. Uh, if if one of their airplanes broke and went down, we would always try and launch an extra one of us, so we would always have more launches than they would have. It was <laughs> things like that that we would always work on. So, uh, yeah, I, I remember this one time that uh, it was actually, the, I think it was the S3 squadron. They uh, they came in and kidnapped our sister squadron's big sword. They had a real sword. I don't know where they got it. <laughs> Who cares? It's, 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 they got it from Scotland or from, from, from someplace. But the, uh, the S3 squadron kidnapped it, and we would have these sur surreptitious videos of this sword all over the ship and these guys would be masked and they'd be saying, we've got your sword. We're going to give it back to you sometime, but you have to do this. So uh, there's all kinds of stuff that went on. It, it was, it was pretty fun. Well, it's incredible. And it's awesome to think about just the, uh, I guess in many ways, the humor that's needed when at sea, of course, being kind of secluded on the aircraft carrier, but you know, what are you going to do with a bunch of guys in their, you know, early twenties, their late twenties. You got to let them let loose somehow, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You you don't want to be taking it out when you're flying. You you don't want to go uh, and do too many risky things when that's going on, whether it's to blow off steam or anything like that. But uh, on the ship, you know, you're in a in an eight man room or a six man room, so you're sharing your six or eight or, or ten month cruise, whatever, with uh, what we would call FMAs, force military acquaintances. And uh, and uh, sometimes you would have port calls. My med cruise with Kennedy was a great port call cruise. We had 12 port calls in uh, six months. So every two weeks we were pulling in somewhere. And uh, there's other times when you will have eight or 10 or uh, six or eight or 10 months or something like that. Right. And you'll have two port calls because wow. you're at sea so often. So it doesn't really happen that often, but uh, the poor calls are good. That's a good time to uh, let off some steam and spend some time with your uh, squadron buddies and uh, give your uh, your sister squadron some uh, some some real grief sometimes. <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of that and the squadrons on the ship, where would VF-14's ready room be located? And then where, would, of course, would be your sleeping quarters? Would you share that with the other squadrons or is each one separate? Oh, no, we did. It would all be squadron uh, squadron specific. There's our ready room was called ready room seven. Ready seven, we called it. So right there, there's seven ready rooms. On some ships, individual ready rooms might be a little bit different sometimes, but we were ready seven. I think VF-32, the other F-14 squadron was ready eight. So they were, we're always right now. You try and keep your, the type aircraft close to each other if you need to do some code briefings or something like that. So we were ready seven, VF-32 was ready eight. And uh, our our six man bunk room was up forward towards the bow. And uh, that's where basically a lot of the uh, officer bunk rooms were. And uh, the the individual bunk rooms would, uh, would be along the outside of the ship. That's where the uh, squadron commanding officer and the squadron exos are and uh ship's company would generally be down on the third deck down below that's where uh, a lot of the ship's officers would be when i was a catapult officer on ike that's where my room was it was down on the third deck which was really nice and quiet down there up on the up on the uh where our rooms were which were on the uh on the second deck or the the o2 or the one level, your catapult, the uh, ship's catapults go right over your head. So you're about 10 feet away from an F-14 going off with a catapult when you're trying to sleep. So that was always kind of cool. 
Well, I mean, with that, the you've got the the noise, but I find it fascinating, you know, life at sea and dealing with the crews, of course, dealing with the ready rooms and the pranks in itself. I've always wondered, you know, when it came down to the food situations and to the living quarters, how would you describe that for your first cruise? Well, it wasn't bad at all. Like I said, we had a, a, I, it was either six man or eight man. I would have to sit there and think about everybody who was in there, but uh, it's 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 part of the life. You know what it's going to be like, you know. And uh, they try and uh, try and weed those types out who are not the socially the uh, social type who can't live with other people. It's uh, um. There's enough workups and whatnot that you can start to see what's going on. So uh, you have your little bunk that you're in. You got the curtains that can close. You got a, a desk with your locker and all that kind of stuff. So you can still find a little bit of privacy there, e even though you're sharing this room with sit with five other guys or seven, seven guys or something like that. The food was uh, always pretty good, I, I thought. I never really had a problem with it. You could eat every six hours. You had breakfast at six, lunch at noon, dinner at six. And then they had mid rats, which was midnight rations, they would call that. And they would uh, cook up a bunch of leftovers from dinner or they would cut up or uh, cook up hamburgers. So you could have these sliders and eat your fill there at midnight and go to bed with a full belly and what we would call a gut bomb that would blow up at some point. <laughs> but uh, it, it's it was always pretty good. I I thought the chow was great, and uh, you know, in the uh, again getting back to the FMAs, your force military acquaintances, you sometimes you get to be best friends with these guys in your room, and sometimes you just tolerate them. That's just the way life is. Outstanding. I mean, it is though. I mean, you know, you learn how to live with people. You know, you don't necessarily have to like them, but hey, you can at least tolerate it, whether it's a six, eight, or a 10 month cruise in itself. Now, through that, you know, daily life on ship when you're not flying, what are you doing if you're not on the board that day for any kind of ops? Well, whether you're on the board or not, you've got what's called your collateral duty. That's your job in the, in the squadron. You've got uh, all these different divisions and all these different branches. The uh, aviation armist branch, the uh, first lieutenant, the uh, a the uh, the engines. There's everything has to be maintained. So you get a job. My br my branch that I had during cruise was avionics and uh, and armaments, av arm. And so you manage those guys. You you got. 10, 12, 18, 20 guys underneath you who work to repair the airplanes, keep the airplanes up and all that kind of stuff. So that is your collateral duty. You are running that. It's part of learning what to do in order to uh, be a manager, to manage people. And uh, you, uh, you spend time in their work center. You spend time with them up on deck or in the hangar bay when they're working on airplanes. You deal with their personal problems. I had people whose parents had passed, or whose, uh, there's this term that I learned on my first cruise, in loco parenti, which means that it's somebody who was acting in, in the, uh, in, as the course of a parent. And this one, uh, one of my uh, enlisted guys, his uncle passed away. He was an older gentleman, but this uncle was in loco parenti. He had raised this uh, enlisted gentleman as his son because the parents had either died or divorced or whatever. And so uh, I had to uh, I had to let him know about that. So there's so social things in addition to the uh, the actual work things. So when you're not flying, you got that going on. You get a big old thick binder that that tracks everything that goes on with all your work centers and all your uh, all your all your troops and stuff like that. And uh, when you have quarters, when you uh, get the squadron together, you stand up in front of them and uh, things like that. So there's a lot of stuff going on. But that's that's what we would typically do when we weren't flying. Well, and I mean, with that, it's pretty unique to realize that you don't just get close to uh, pilots or Rios or aircraft crewmen. You get close to the other guys on ship who their daily life is just a sailor. Oh, yeah. 
especially the guys that work around the airplanes because they're the ones getting the airplanes ready for us to fly. And uh, it's always, it's not just smart to don't piss them off, but it's, uh, it's always good to be in, uh, be in close with those guys. And you always shake hands when you leave and you always shake hands when you come back. And I always made it a thing, a, a thing to say, thanks for your hard work. And I'm, I have come across and uh, become very good friends with uh, probably about a half dozen of those guys in my Facebook world. Um, just over, over time, uh, get to talk to them again. And uh, it's kind of neat. They were in their early 20s. I was in my late 20s then in the, uh, in the late 80s and whatnot. And now we're all just old farts. <laughs> I mean... But still, it's unique to see the the bond that's even created years after, not with just those of you in the fodder community, but just guys you shared life with on ship. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, no question. And through this, I know there's a story uh, mentioned in the book, um, but I'm curious, when you're at sea on cruise, how do you get mail from home? <laughs> that's a funny story. I want... You're in the Mediterranean, so you're at sea, and you are uh, sailing around. You're on this carrier; it's got five thousand people on it. So there's even if one, even if every person got one piece of mail, that's still five thousand pieces of mail that have to go from the United States. And let's say you live in count your your friend, your girlfriend, your wife, whatever lives somewhere or is spending your cruise time somewhere. It's got to go from where it is mailed to the East Coast, across the Atlantic, into the Mediterranean, and then onto an airplane that's going to fly out to the ship, land on the ship, get offloaded, get sorted, and then uh, find its way to you. And uh, a, uh, just as a real side note, my wife at the time, Carrie, mailed me a uh, letter or a card, one of those things. It, it made it from Chesapeake, Virginia, or I guess, Virginia Beach, sorry, Virginia Beach, Virginia, to the ship and in my arms in two days. I don't know how it did that, but the postmark was one day, and I got it about a day or two later. <laughs> I guess it must have hit everything. But uh, the story that I said in the book, it's uh, something that goes around. It's one of these things that happens that uh, in, in this story, it's ship's company that does it. There was uh, there was a new guy who had just checked on the ship, and he's a young one. He doesn't know anything about aircraft carriers, and so they like to yank his chain a little bit. And uh, he was uh, up on the O10 level, up on top of the island or something like that. And uh, the guy said, "Okay, you're you're the you're the mail buoy watch." And the guy said, "What's the mail buoy?" Well, you know, when ships are sailing around, they can't really mail mail send mail to the normal way. So we have these things called mail buoys, which is a buoy out in the middle of water that we put mail in. And uh, when ships come by, they stop by and they check that. It's like checking your mailbox. And they take the mail out of that and they put mail in it. So that's how it is. And uh, this was, uh, this particular time was uh, down off the Florida Straits. The ship, the Eisenhower was headed down that way to, uh, to do some uh, flight operations and whatnot. And uh, so, and what they say is they tell this guy that he's got to wear all the appropriate gear. He's got to have this, this general quarters helmet on. He's got to have this big K-POC life jacket just in case he falls, even though he's like uh, 80 feet up in the air on top of the island or something like that. And he's got to have these, uh, these binoculars and he's, He's technically a, a man overboard watch or something like that, but he's being told, you just keep an eye out for the mail buoy. So the guy is searching. He's got his binoculars up and he's looking around. And then all of a sudden he says, hey, I think I see the mail buoy. And these guys are saying, ah, ha, 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 yeah, yeah, fine. What'd you find? So they take a look through the binoculars and it turns out to be a couple of Cubans who had escaped Cuba in a homemade raft that they made, they'd been drifting around in the middle of summer in the Straits of Florida for about three days. They were burnt to an absolute crisp. But this this man overboard sailor 
saw it and he thought that was the mail buoy. So he said, I got the mail buoy. I got it. We ended up, uh, I was down in my stateroom during this time and the uh, chairs, the office chairs are on wheels and the ship literally did about a 90 degree brake turn as it stopped and it turned around and it healed so much. The office chair in my room rolled across the deck and slapped, slammed against the wall. And we turned around, came back, slowed down. They launched a motor well boat with uh, with with a with a half dozen guys in it. They went and got these guys, brought them on board. We flew them off to Key West. I don't know what happened to them, but uh, we uh, kind of mentioned that uh, if they uh, since they didn't make it to uh, to the shore, they were probably sent back to Cuba. But that was a story about the mail buoy. Kind of fun. Well, I mean, through that, it is it is funny, but even crazy enough to think that, you know, you guys happen to find two guys out there in the middle of the Florida Straits. I assume that they had little food or rations, if any at all. And, you know, honestly, the ship could have saved some guys' lives from dying at sea. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no doubt. And you think about what that captain did. And, uh, of course, it it's going to be up to the captain. And uh, he turned that $4 billion asset around on a dime, basically. It's nuclear powered. So anytime you screw around with that nuclear reactor and pull the rods out and push the rods in and all that kind of stuff, it, it's costing an awful lot of money. And that's what he did because anytime you're going to go out there and uh, when you see something like that, you're going to do what you can to save those guys. Now, was that your only incident of seeing just – people floating around in the ocean from Cuba or anywhere in sea, or was that an isolated incident? Well, that in, in my case, that was an isolated incident. We didn't, didn't come across anybody else or didn't find anybody else or anything like that. There is another story in the book that I talk about from a catapult officer perspective. That's uh, steam drives a ship and aircraft carrier is kind of changing now with the new, Ford class carriers, they've got these electromagnetic catapults, the kind of thing that you see in the uh in the uh in the uh in the amusement parks and stuff like that, when you've got a series of these great big honking big magnets that go on and go off and that accelerates something. That's how they're launching aircraft now. But back then in the old days, and uh <clears throat> most of the carriers still now use steam as catapult. And uh there's a story I had heard about this. It didn't happen when I was there, but it was uh, knocking around that uh, the steam that is generated to run catapults so that we as catapult officers can launch airplane is generated by the snipes, we call them, by the engineers, by the engine guys down, down below and by the reactor guys. They have to create the steam that comes up. And if they have something going on, if there's a problem, if there's some uh, firefighting drills going on. It's taking water away. It's taking steam away or something like that. When it comes time to launch the aircraft, we might not have the steam that's re That happens. The air boss is saying, hey, Bow, why aren't you launching aircraft? And we sometimes a, a good answer is steam. We got to wait on the, or boss, we got to wait on the steam. The, uh, the engineers are, aren't giving us the steam yet. So uh, waiting on steam, boss. Waiting on steam. And then all of a sudden, so that's going on for a couple of minutes. You will find out when you launch airplanes, it is launched. I got a thing saying my internet connection is unstable. You're good. If there's a problem with it, I do apologize. But you launch on the button, on the time. When that sweep second hand hits, Whatever time you're supposed to launch, you got to have an aircraft in the air. And if it's not there, waiting on Steam Boss can only last so long. So we're waiting, we're waiting. And then all of a sudden, one of our V2 catapult enlisted guys, you can see his head pop up in the catwalk. He sees where he's supposed to be. He's late. And so he gets up and he starts running across the flight deck, going to his to his workstation and whatnot. And the boss comes up on the radio and says, hey, Bal, I think I see your steam. It's all ready to go. He's running across the deck right now. 
So that was that was a kind of funny way of uh, looking at it. But I tell you, sometimes when you don't get that steam, you got to do what you can to make sure you don't get in trouble. Well, speaking of steam and cat launches, how common is it for the catapult to break in itself just due to the power associated with it with the steam? Well, it was my experience on Eisenhower. Of course, we got four catapults, and uh, they are incredibly complex organizations and pieces of equipment when you think about what they have to do time and time and time and time again. And uh, our catapults broke down very, very, very rarely. And part of that is because, and this is why V2 your air department has got VO, which is the admin people, V1, which are the guys that run the uh, hangar deck and the, uh, I, if I remember correctly, V2 are the catapults and resting gear guy. V3 are, uh, that might be the uh, hangar deck people. And V4, I think, might be the fuel people. So uh, you've got the V2 guys who are the catapult uh, guys you might have 12 hours or 10 hours of flight ops scheduled. Well, those catapults are going to go through a couple hours of pre-operational checks that have to be done before flight ops. So those guys are up two hours before anybody else even has to think about getting to work. And then at the end of flight operations, there's about two hours of post-operational maintenance and checks that have to be done. So there's an awful lot of maintenance that is done, whether it's uh, it's preventative maintenance to make sure it doesn't break, or if something does start to sound bad or go bad or something like that, you're going to have guys that are going to be working their backsides off like anything to make sure that those things are going on. We had a, uh, we had a requirement to get X number of aircraft in the air with a certain amount, within a certain amount of time. And so we would have four catapults firing within a minute. And then we would reload those catapults to the next airplane and we'd have two more or four more going off again. And we would have to get, in, in the old days, I, I, I say the old days, like the early nineties when I was a catapult officer on Eisenhower, we still had alpha strikes where they would launch a dozen aircraft. They would go on this alpha strike. And so we had to get a bunch of airplanes in the air very quickly and very efficiently. And we would do it on the bow catapults and on the waist catapults. But at some point, you've got to finish the waist catapults because you start, have to start recovering aircraft. And those waist catapults have to have to be wrapped up and closed down so that you can make a ready deck so that the airplanes that are up in the air can come down and land. So really complex program there. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, whether you're on the bow catapults or on the waist catapults, once you get that launch, if you're on the bow catapults, you break off to the right. That way, if something happens with the airplane malfunction, you don't want to water land in front of the boat because that boat's not stopping. And there's that's exactly that right. That's 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 during day VFR operations. You're going to take off the bow and then go to your right and take off. And there's uh, departure procedures that you do you track outbound on a certain navigation radial till you get to a certain distance and then you can start elevating and flying up when you're launching off the waist you turn to the left again you want to get out of the path of the ship as the ship is going through the water you don't want to go straight ahead and uh like you said if you do have engine problems maybe you're going to have a some sort of uh, engine out or something like that the Tomcat had two engines. That was always good to have. Most of the aircraft that during our cruise, it was always a, uh, we always had an aircraft with, with two engines in it. So that was good. At nighttime, it's a little bit different. You stay flying straight ahead, but you start climbing right away. So uh, it's just easier. You don't want to be in that low altitude as you're starting to gain speed and uh, get a little bit of uh that flight worthiness, you don't want to be yanking around, turning, and stuff like that at night. So at nighttime, when you take off, you just fly straight ahead and start to elevate, start to climb up some. 
Well, speaking of some nighttime flying, just out of curiosity, from a backseater's point of view, when, when you get those launches at night and, you know, whether it's a, a horrible visibility um, or whether you've got a bright full moon, how does the ocean look at night when you're at, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 feet and you're just cruising along? What's that picture-esque view from a Rio's point of view? Well, uh, what you're asking about what it looks like from, from altitude and stuff or well, there's one picture you might be able to look it up that I I took. We were probably at twenty or twenty five thousand feet or so, and you can see this little itty bitty little dot down there, at the which is the Kennedy. You can see the wake of it. You can see it turning as it starts to come doing its little uh, PIM. It's called PIM, which is position and movement. I think is what the uh, PIM stands for and whatnot. It really looks tranquil down there, but. When you start thinking that uh, if you happen to hit that water at any kind of speed, it's like concrete. Yep. So it's not, it's not, yep, that one right there. That's the Kennedy right in the middle of that shot. I thought that was kind of cool. That is a beautiful but, uh, shot. When you, when you first take off as a Rio, you're just along for the ride. I, I was told once it doesn't matter how senior you are as a Rio, you never have 49, more than 49% ownership or command of that airplane the pilot's always got at least 51 because he's flying the damn thing so uh when you're out there and you're a nugget you're brand new you start to learn what it's like when you get that kick in the butt when the catapult fires when you go from zero to 150 130 140 or something like that you hit the end of the catapult track and you get that line that 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 extra little kick that happens and whatnot, you you come to learn what's a good shot. And eventually, you'll hear this sometime because I've 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 got a little bit of video that uh, I recorded once from the pilot's gun camera, which is up in front of a shot that Jim Jones and I did. And at the end of it, when it hits that the end of the cat track, you can hear me say, "Good shot." And it's a it, it's a feeling you get, the acceleration, the G's that you have, which isn't all that bad, but it is a good uh, good kind of kind of kind of feeling when you get that kick in the back, and when you're when you clear that deck, and you're flying, you know it's a good shot, and uh, so, my last night cat shot was uh, a little bit of a uh, slow shot. It was a nighttime shot, and we came off catapult one. And I can remember we settled. We came off the catapult and we dropped a little bit. Now the flight deck is only 70 feet above the water. And the Tomcat with its wings out is about 65 feet wingtip to wingtip, nose to tail. So if you turned it sideways, 65 feet, you would basically be dragging your left wingtip. You don't want to turn at night, of course, like I said, you stay, stay flying straight ahead. But this nighttime cat shot, we settled and we dropped down. And I remember, and this is my last night cat shot. I was leaving the squadron the next day, checking out. And there's a rotating beacon on the bottom of the airplane that rotates around and, and flashes. And I could see very clearly this rotating beacon reflecting off the water <laughs> as we were flying. I never reached for the ejection handle. I had a good feeling that it was a good shot. Our skipper, uh, Pete Strickland, said once that uh, he did low speed testing on catapult shots, I believe, when he was at test pilot school. And he basically said, if you got about 110 knots in speed, if you've got nose authority, if you can move the nose, you've got enough flying things going on that you'll probably fly out of it, fly away from it. And I could tell at that time it was my 200 cat shot or uh, 220th, 230th cat shot, whatever it was. And uh, so I I had a good feeling of what a good cat shot, what, what a good shot was. I didn't have any bad shots where I had to eject or anything like that. But uh, I could tell that we had the nose authority. We had a pretty good airspeed. Air but there's 
there's two ways, well, three ways, I guess you can talk to your pilot. One is you can yell at them. Number two is you got a button here on the left that activates the intercom system. So you talk through your mask and stuff like that. The third one is like the Flintstones, we've got these, these feet buttons. The radio is on the right, the intercom is on the left. So you, you can, I never, you don't use that too much too often. I always use the uh, the uh, hand button more often, but uh, I jammed on that left intercom button, and all I could say was climb, 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 climb. That's that was what I wanted to make sure. You know, it's not like how you doing up there, Doc? Are we flying? Do we need to be jet or anything like that? It was like climb, 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 climb. So uh, we started climbing, and uh, one good feeling that I had is that. The mini bot up in the island, you've got the boss and the mini boss. The mini boss takes care of the bow area. The boss, the air boss, takes care of the waste area and the landing stuff. And the mini boss came over the radio and said, Hey, 107, how you doing? He saw us drop down a little bit too, right after the catch stroke. So he was he was calling to make sure that we weren't having any engine problems or something like that. So it kind of gave me a good feeling that, yeah. The boss saw what I saw, so uh, that felt good. Well, and I mean, with that, and speaking of these good feelings, I know talking with Magic, uh, I've been talking with Oki Nance, like I said, and even Hey Joe. Were you ever a part of any uh, shit hot breaks over the bow of a ship and come in for one of these super hot landings? I'm sure, I'm sure we were at some point, but uh, there's nothing that, that that really stands out where you come over. You hit the brake of the bow at 500 knots. You snap the throttles back to idle, and you just sit there and coast around. You don't touch that. Everything is done. We didn't. If there were things like that, my my job was as a Rio. I was watching everything to make sure that everything was done. The wings came out. The flaps came down. That the wheels came down. That as we were starting to come around and hitting the 90. I'm telling the pilots what our altitude is at the 90. I'm telling him when he lines up, what his lineup is like. Or he's looking at three things. He's looking at lineup, angle of attack, and airspeed. And I'm keeping up a constant on-speed uh, kind of reporting to him. We will find out, I will find out, what an on-speed is based on our weight. When we take off, we know what the base airplane weight is. 144 pounds, something, or 144,000 pounds, or something like that. We would factor in 20,000 pounds of gas. That's 164,000 pounds the airplane's going to take off with. We're going to burn out of that 20,000 pounds of gas. We're going to burn, say, uh, 12,000 pounds. We're going to come back with 8,000 pounds of gas. So the weight of the airplane is going to be 144, the base empty fuel jet, plus 8,000 pounds of gas. Is going to be 152,000 pounds, and we cross-check that with the wind over the deck, and that's going to give us what on speed is going to be for the uh, for the appropriate landing uh, sequence. That'll be very specific. That'll be at 132 knots, 134 knots, something like that, whatever it is. And so when we straighten out, the pilot gets on speed, on lineup, on angle of attack. And the airplane is coming down at where it needs to be. I'm going to be telling him, "You're one knot fast. You're two knots fast." A little bit difficult with the parallax that happens with that little gauge that we were looking at. We didn't have digital airspeed indicators. Not that I would want one. As far as I could tell, that uh, analog uh, gauge that always worked for me. And I would I would keep up a running. And so in the back of my mind, in the back of his mind, he knows if he's a little bit of fast. You get into aerodyn aerodynamics here. If you're going to be, if your airspeed is going to be fast, you're going to have more wind coming over the wings. That's going to create more lift. It's going to lift you up more. That's going to get you out of your landing sequence. Uh, same thing. If you're going to be two knots slow, there's going to be less air going over the wings. That means you're going to be less lift. It's going to drop you down. You don't want that. You're going to be on speed. And if you're on speed and with the right angle of attack, however many units of angle of attack it is, and you're on glide slope, 
and you're on center line, you're going to land and get that three wire every time. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, if you even come in just two knots slower, two knots below where you're supposed to land, you're going to have a ramp strike where you're not even. Well, I, I wouldn't say a uh, full kind of ramp strike or anything like that. I got my cat down here, Sophie, who's doing what your dog is doing earlier. You got to be significantly slow or slowing to have a ramp strike and you got to be low already. The The problem with those kind of things, one of the big problems is the amount of time it took to add energy to those engines. So it's a spool up time, they call it. You might come up and add power to it, but it'll take a couple seconds for those engines to, to get to a point where it's generating more exhaust coming out of there. So uh, what you don't want is grab one of those that first that one or two wire or something like that. That means you're starting to nibble on the wrong the wrong end of the envelope in terms of uh, being low and being slow. You don't want to be low and slow. One of my pilots, Dave Hosman, his his call sign was Hooter. Everybody is debriefed by the LSO by the landing signal officer after their landing. The LSO came in and was telling Hooter just a little bit high and fast on this landing. Hooter says, just the way I like it, man, just the way I like it. A little high, a little fast. So <laughs> you don't want to be low and slow. You'd rather be high and fast and still grab a wire. I understand that. And I've definitely heard that sentiment from uh, Magic, most certainly. Oh, yeah. Uh, for this last question, Pinch, um, I've been asking all the F-14 guys this because uh, I've been told it's a great question, is that you spent your time with the VF-14. Yep. You've done another tour. And yep. if you had any squadron of your war choice, what's the squadron you would have wanted to have a tour with? <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. The uh, Rich Johnson, he, that's a name that a lot of these older guys will know. Rich was an F, is or was back in the day. He was an F4 Rio. And uh, the cool thing about Rich Johnson is that when my dad had VF 43, Rich came down, was a stashed ensign with the, with the uh, he graduated from the Naval Academy, stashed with VF-43 for, uh, I don't know how long, a couple of months, three or four months, as a stashed ensign. And later on, uh, Rich was one of my instructors down in VT-86, down in Pensacola. And later on, I was sent to the Theodore Roosevelt to... Uh, Eisenhower was in the dry dock, so they sent me out the TR in the med for some uh, to get some catapult officers called. Rich Johnson was the air boss, and uh, he told me when at the end of my VT eighty six Rio training, he said you're going to go to either VF fourteen or VF thirty one. I don't know how he knew that or what. But he told me VF-14 or VF-31. And we called VF-31 at that time the pencil noses because they had black nose cones. And uh, lo and behold, about uh, 10 or 12 months later, I got selected by uh, by Dan Chop, who was the XO, to go to VF-14. So if I had to do another squadron, I'd probably do 31, the Tomcatters. <laughs> well, just so, just so that Jill's – or that uh, – Rich's prophecy would have come true. I mean, and through that, it's humorous, but I always find it fascinating because, I mean, it, you've got a lot of unique F-14 squadrons. I mean, hell, you know it. You saw them in itself. But you had some incredibly famous ones that go back to pre-World War One, or I guess post-World War One, I should say. Excellent squadrons. You had a remarkable service in World War Two, And then you've just got the, the paint schemes, the mascots, the logos. I mean, they're all over the place. Oh, yeah. That, it, it, that's kind of getting back to what I said about the late 80s being the absolute pinnacle of the F-14s, both its life and its air-to-air -air world. Shortly after I left the squadron, or about the time that I left the squadron, they started dropping bombs. And uh, the jet was designed as a bomb dropper, and it really did turn into a great bomb dropper. And especially when you put that lantern pot on, it was a great laser-guided bomb dropper. And uh, 
So, but in the in that last eighties, as a fighter, as a pure fighter, that was the absolute peak, and we had again the absolute maximum number of F-14 squadrons. I can't remember exactly what it was, 24, 26, 28, something like that. But in the two years that I spent when I left the F-14 and when I finished up my Grumman tour, and I was hoping to get back to an F-14 squadron, but uh, they had already started to decommission and, and to close down squadrons. Yeah. And there were at least eight or 10 squadrons that were either on their way out or were gone by the time I left the uh, Grumman tour. And uh, so that was the start of the drawdown. It was, it obviously coincided with the 19, with, with 1990. And we all know what happened in 1990. The yes, Soviet right. Union went away. We were down in Puerto Rico for one of my last at sea periods. There was a Soviet surface action group that was coming down out of the North Cape doing the, uh, the Atlantic crossing coming down to Cuba. And uh, they were passing, I don't know, 50 miles away from us or something like that from the, uh, from the Eisenhower. Maybe it was a Kennedy. I can't remember. But we, were, we had a flight deck scrub going on. There wasn't, a way, there wasn't any way that we could launch an airplane, even if we wanted to, inside of an hour or something like that to clean up. Every, and that's, what the, uh, that, that, that's where the Cold War had gotten to. I'm sure we had submarines and we had probably P-3s tracking their submarines, but the fact that all of their surface ships were coming so close to all of our surface ships, and we were just down there doing workups, so I don't know what kind of weapon status we had. It, it didn't matter. That was the state of the Cold War at that point, and within a year, uh, six months or a year, the Soviet Union was dead, and uh, so... We don't, and that's that's what I would explain to people. When the Soviet Union went away, the Navy, like any kind of business, when your customer base goes away, you got to get smaller, and that's what the Navy had to do. And uh, one of the things I think I explained or uh, talked about this in either the first or the second interview, the F-14 was designed for that outer air battle. Up in the uh, North Atlantic, in the in the GI UK gap, and with the Soviet Union gone away like that, we didn't need it. We didn't need the Tomcat. The Tomcat could no longer be a single mission airplane. It had to do many other things, and that's why it why it got into bomb dropping, into close air support, into forward air controller, into all sorts of different things. So, uh, yeah, but uh, there's so much history in all those squadrons. And uh, that's one reason why VF-14 was saved. When they started to get rid of all the F-14 squadrons, out of the two squadrons in an air wing, they would usually get rid of the lower numbered squadron, which was 100 series. You would have the 100 and the 200 series. The 200 series was also a TARPS squadron. That means they carry the reconnaissance pod to take pictures and stuff like that. And so the lower numbered squadron, the 100 series, would be the one that would be canceled, closed, shut down, whatever. But with that history that VF-14 had, starting in 1919, with an unbroken history all the way through at that time up to, I think it was 2007 or eight or something like that, they didn't want to lose that history. So they saved VF-14, transitioned them to uh, single seat Hornets, and uh, they're still flying. The top hatter is still flying out on the West Coast out of Lemoore. Wow. I mean, it's incredible to think about how VF-14 has lasted for as long as it did. I know um, my dad's squadron, when he was in the Air Force, uh, 71st Tactical Fighter Squadron, they were shut down in 2006 or seven, And they've just been reopened as of, I think, 2020 or 2021 as a training squadron now. But I mean, it was a loss. Um, the squadron had been uh, had its roots back to World War One, and I mean, it's a huge part of aviation. It is the heritage of what the forefathers did in that squadron in conflicts prior. It helped set the standard for what you might have to do in the future. Well, that, that's another reason I think why 
VF-31, the Tomcatters might have been the uh, squadron that I would have liked to have been part of. I remember some of these, uh, uh, there were a handful of years ago, they found one of the carriers that was sunk out, out uh, in the Pacific, and they uh, sent the, the uh, remote vehicle down all, all the way, and it was taking pictures. And right on the side of this airplane that was in the hangar bay was Felix the Cat Felix carrying the bomb. And uh, it's that kind of hit. That's from 1943, 44, whatever time frame that that was. That's the uh, that history is kind of special. The top hat came about, I think, probably in the 1920s, maybe the 1930s. I can't really remember. But it uh, when when they got it, it it stuck. Well, and I think one of the things that I love about the F-14, and of course the nickname Tomcat, is what it stems from. I mean. You know, you've got the Wildcat, which paved the way in 41 and 42 in those early battles at um, oh, Coral Sea and Midway, Santa Cruz. You've got the Hellcat, which then carries on the weight of 43 to 45. You even got the, the Bearcat and the Tiger Cat. And I loved when the Navy picked up the Tomcat to continue that lineage of the cats of what they've done and how they're going to pave the way for the future. That just, just as a kind of segue or not segue but a uh aside working those two years that i did up at grumman was just absolutely great i loved it great people there i used to say that uh that uh, if money wasn't a problem long island would be a fun place to live but of course money always is a problem there but but the history that you learn about that back during the war i i had I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like Grumman produced in one day during World War II, something incredible like 1,500, 2,000 airplanes that were complete, that were put together, completed, test flown, and flown off in one day or something like that. It was that kind of job that was going on. And when you start thinking about that and all those different, I've got what I think is a pretty good uh, missing man formation air show shot from the from 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 those days back in the early 80s or in the uh not the early 80s I was still in college then uh in the mid 80s when I got into it and whatnot of all of the Grumman cats the bear cat the wild cat the tiger cat the tom cat and the uh whatever the fifth cat was coming flying over Oceana during the Oceana air show wow. and the tom cat is just starting to elevate going up out of the missing man formation and uh, yeah, that that whole cat history. And I'm sorry, it's it's all done now. I used to like to say, and uh, it was a it was a big deal that Leroy Grumman's big problem that he did was that he founded his air, airplane company in some of the highest rent territory ever in the U.S. McDonnell Douglas picked St. Louis, Missouri. Leroy Grumman picked Long Island, and with Beth Page and Calverton. Just they just got uh, they just got built. I mean, cost out of out of existence because it cost too much money to to uh, kind of live there. Well, and I mean, bringing this together, it's even this right here. You know, pinch this continues the legacy of Grumman of, you know, me trying to reach out to guys in the F-14 community to tell their stories of continuing the legacy of the Tomcat and the relevancy it still has today. I mean, it's still one of the most, if not the most popular jet fighter that has possibly ever existed and maybe will. Well, yeah, that, that's, a, but I'm kind of biased with that. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, you are right. It, it is, it's just thinking about the whole Tomcat thing, you know, the, the numbers that were built. There were 4,000, 4,500, whatever, F-4s that were built. There were 712 Tomcats built. That was it, 712. 80 were supposed to go to Iran. 79 made it there. They, the 80th one ended up getting, uh, ended up staying here because that's when the Itola took over. But... Uh, <clears throat> So the only place flying, still flying those is Iran. We all know that. And they started to say that, or they basically said, we don't want any spare parts to make its way there. 
through the black market. So every Tomcat, and I would say 90, 99, five, 99% whatever of those Tomcats that are in museums now are, are demilitarized. They are just ripped apart. There's no way you could play a Tom or fly a Tomcat now if you wanted to. I'm pretty certain about that. There were people that tried to get one for the uh, for the air show circuit, for the uh, heritage flights, stuff like that. But there's no way that the uh, that the government was going to let any of those things uh, hang around. So they're just basic shells right now. The one in the Smithsonian uh, in uh, D.C. at the uh, Udvar Hazy, uh, I kind of like. I've got flight time in that one. That's one of the MIG killers from our uh, from our time frame, 1989. VF-32, they had uh, brought it back in and rebuilt it as a uh, from an A to a D. And that one might still have a lot of, it still has a lot of the the important parts to it. I don't know if you could crank it up again and fly it or not, but uh, but most of them are just, uh, just basic shells right now. Well, I mean, it's pretty incredible to think about the, the aspect of the downsizing, but to the F-14s that are still out there, and I think for our next interview, that's going to be a good talking point of the F-14s out there, but also your time with Grumman and, of course, the impact that had on you, but what you witnessed there. And then talk about perhaps the future of the F-14 with Iran of possible conflict. You know, I mean, there is the chance that, you know, F-18s and Hornets might be dogfighting Iranian F-14s in the future and downing them possibly in scenarios. We just don't know. Yeah, it's uh, something that we saw. We were off, off the coast of Egypt, and a bunch of F-16s came flying by, uh, flown by Egyptians because they had the F-16 then, whatnot. And uh, the word was, uh, it's not how well you can drive a camel, it's how well you can drive an airplane. <laughs> and I think that's that that's going to be the big thing when uh, if it ever comes down to a uh, the us versus the uh, F-14 world uh, that remains. They don't have many left, maybe a couple dozen, something like that. But uh, we can get in that next time if you'd like to. I'd love to, Pinch. I mean, per usual, this was fantastic. Thanks for your service. I mean, the stories are great, and I love hearing more. I mean, this just keeps building. It gets better every time. You bet, Zach. Not a problem. Love talking about this. It's fun getting back into it and uh, talking about all these things and even getting back to my dad's time and stuff like that. That's good to do. Yes, sir. Well, we'll hopefully get together sometime next week. I'm on spring break next week, and we can have another one of these. All righty. We'll talk to you then. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, bud. Bye. Bye.